Dragon's Rising Season 1 is really, really good. Not only would I say that Dragon's Rising Season 1 is really good, I would go as far as to say it's one of the best Ninjago seasons we've gotten in almost half a decade. I have not had this much faith and excitement in the future of Ninjago as an IP since the only trilogy through Season 11, which I consider to be the absolute golden age of this franchise. The previous installment to Dragon's Rising and the final season of the original Ninjago series Crystallized left me feeling really disillusioned and upset with the state of the Ninjago IP. I figured that was it. As far as my opinions on it go, the Ninjago show completely jumped the shark for me with this season, and it was going to take an absolutely insane effort to get me back on board after Crystallized. And somehow, after all of the catastrophically terrible plot decisions made for the Ninjago show in Crystallized, its direct follow-up, Dragon's Rising, has officially won me back. After 2022's disasters, it feels so good to be able to say this completely unironically, Ninjago is back. We are in such a good place as Ninjago fans right now. And I'm so happy that previous videos I've made, such as why I don't care about Ninjago 2023, have aged like absolute milk after seeing the final product of this year's Ninjago. I could go around in circles of this, but I'll just say Dragon's Rising is amazing and I'm so happy to be excited about Ninjago again. And if you want to go in yourself and watch the first season of Dragon's Rising with no spoilers, this is your chance to click off the video and go do that now. In America, it's on Netflix. In the UK, it's on ITVX. I highly recommend you check out this show. The people who want to go into the show spoiler free are gone. All right, good. So straight off the bat, I've just got to say the 22 minute episode format is back and it is so much better than the 11 minute episodes. I enjoyed those 11 minute long episodes, don't get me wrong, but the 22 minute format is just so much better for the pacing. It gives us way more time for scenes to breathe, for characters to interact, and for things to just happen. I really like it. 22 minute episodes definitely fit what Ninjago is going for a lot better than 11 minute ones do, and I'm super glad they reverted to them for Dragon's Rising. That combined with the count of 20 episodes makes for a Ninjago season that never feels like it's struggling for runtime. I had concerns about the Ninjago show creators ditching the Focus Ninja format for Ninjago storytelling. However, if every Ninjago season going forward is going to have this 22 minute long 20 episode runtime, then I think we're going to be just fine. Because the way this first season distributes character focus between all of the protagonists was absolutely great. Splitting the series premiere of Dragon's Rising into two 22 minute long episodes, much like how the original Ninjago series pilot was paced, was such a smart move. This is no usual premiere. This is the premiere to a whole new Ninjago show and with it, it needs to introduce its new characters and its new world. So allotting 44 minutes worth of screen time to that premiere, much like the original show did, is such a great way to give us plenty of room to flesh out all these new concepts, to where they're just well developed enough to get us hooked on them for the later episodes to properly flesh them out. Also, good lord, the animation in this new show is top tier. When discussing Ninjago's animation, Ninjago fans often split the show into two categories, the seasons produced by Will Film and the seasons produced by Wild Brain Studios. The seasons produced by Will Film usually receive praise for the amazing lighting details at the end of their run and the environmental quality. Whereas the seasons produced by Wild Brain generally receive praise for the quality of the character movements and the fight choreography and stuff like that. Basically, with Ninjago, you had two extremes. Did you want insanely good lighting and environmental design, or did you want the insanely good fight choreography? Now, that's not to say that Wilfilm had bad fights, or that Wild Brain had bad looking environments. It's just saying that these studios excelled at particular things. The visuals of Dragon's Rising, however, these are the best looking that Ninjago has ever looked. With this season, Wild Brain has decided to slightly dial back on the quality of the fight choreography and put more resources into the environmental design and the lighting. And it looks amazing. Is the fight choreography slightly worse than seasons like Crystallized? Sure. But the fights in this show still range from being pretty good to excellent. So if fight choreography was something they had to sacrifice a bit to make the show look this good, I'm honestly okay with that. Dragon's Rising feels like the best of Will Film and World Brain's animation. Rolled together into a final product that looks so amazing that it could find itself in a cinema and not look out of place. The switch to Unreal Engine 5 to produce Ninjago's visuals is majorly paying off, and I'm really happy with the new visual direction for this show. If this is the baseline for Ninjago's visuals going forward, I am so excited to see what Wild Brain Studios does next. But so what? Sure, you have plenty of runtime now, and you have the most amazing visuals, but similarly to seasons like Crystallized, if you don't have a good story to back it up, all of that kind of falls flat. 
So it's a good thing Dragon's Rising is one of the best stories we've had from this IP in years. Status quo changes. We asked for them in the Ninjago storyline and we finally got them. As Ninjago went on for longer and longer, it became more and more formulaic, taking less risks and not really taking any major steps to progress the overarching storyline at all. Coming from someone who enjoyed the 11 minute era all in all, it did really start to feel like the central characters were just stuck in purgatory doing the same stuff over and over again. But however, with the start of this new show, it feels like a weight has finally been lifted off of the Ninjago story's shoulders and now it can actually progress again. The characters can keep growing into new roles and have new experiences, new characters can finally join the ninja team again, something we haven't seen since 2015. It's great stuff and I think it's the lifeblood of what makes this first season work so well, so I want to talk about some of it. The biggest change to the Ninjago formula here is probably the introduction of the merge, so we should talk about that first. The merge was a cataclysmic event, which led the 16 realms we saw in the original Ninjago series to all smash together, forming one massive new world. An incredibly risky plot decision that changes the foundation of Ninjago's world building itself, but I think it's one that majorly paid off. So Ninjago in those first five seasons had a really great sense of exploration and discovery, finding out about the Ninjago world for the first time. Obviously, when you get to season 15 of that format, that exploration is kind of lost. You can't really say that's an inherent problem with Ninjago, that's just what happens when a show runs for a long time, but there was definitely a sense of discovery that was lost somewhere down the line in that original show. Dragon's Rising, however, has set us up to where we can essentially rediscover the entire Ninjago world and get that sense of discovery back. Not only that, but thanks to the fact that there are 16 other realms in Ninjago, we have way more space to work with now. What Ninjago has done here is essentially future-proofed its world, giving us way more room to explore new locations going forward. Not only that, but Dragon's Rising has also refreshed established Ninjago locations. For example, after they rebuilt the Monastery of Spinjitsu again and crystallized, I was so tired of seeing this location in the show. But Dragon's Rising, using the merge as a plot device, refreshed all of these old locations, giving them a brand new, really weird coat of paint. And I love it! Exploring how the monastery changed as a result of the merge in episode 2 was a really fun part of that episode for me. And it's got me genuinely excited to revisit more old Ninjago locations and see how the merge has changed them. Like, I would love to see what the merge has done to Styx or Malopia or other places like that. Ninjago's world, both what's already been established to longtime fans and what's new as a result of the merge, is incredibly interesting to me and I'm so excited to see what they do with it next. And speaking of iconic staples of Ninjago being refreshed for this new era, let's talk about the ninja team itself. Throughout the original Ninjago show, the ninja team consisted of Kai, Nia, Jay, Cole, Zane, and Lloyd. Six separate characters and their master Wu, all as the central protagonists of the show. A lot of the time, this led to characters having to basically just fight for focus and screen time because of how many protagonists there were. A problem that Dragon's Rising so far has not faced. The core cast of Dragon's Rising boils down to four characters, Lloyd, Sora, Aaron, and Ryu. Wildfire will probably fully integrate into this cast in Season 2 as well. Hearing about this when this was announced really worried me. Not because it's a bad idea, I think it's an excellent idea, but I felt like it was the wrong time for it, as Crystallized had derailed the characters quite a bit. But Dragon's Rising makes the very smart move to have the original five ninja still play a prominent role in the season. So whilst those other five ninja aren't central protagonists anymore, they are still incredibly important characters and you see them very often. Giving us basically the best of both worlds. The cast isn't incredibly bloated, but also those original characters still get stuff to do. For example, Nia will jump in for a few episodes and then go away to research stuff in Cloud Kingdom, or Cole will jump in for an episode or two and then go and chase Master Wu's ghost. It's really great stuff. And on top of that, the material these other five ninja get throughout the season is really, really good. And even fixes some of my problems with Crystallized. But before we talk about the original ninja, we're going to talk about the new ninja first. No, no, not those ones. Aaron is possibly one of the best things to happen to this franchise's story in years. What I love about Aaron is that he's a kid who grew up inspired by the legend of the ninja. He memorizes all their moves, learns a bunch of random factoids about them, and is just generally invested in everything they do. Does that sound like anyone we know? Aaron is a stand-in for fans of the original show, and I think that is such a great premise for a character. Not only that, but the existence of Aaron as a character really reinforces how important and legendary the original ninja are. To the point where he self-taught himself Spinjitsu, something that's almost never been done by anyone in Ninjago's canon before, solely going off of his inspiration and love for that original ninja team. Which gives basically everything the ninja did across that original series so much more weight. On top of that, Aaron has no elemental powers. Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! Yes! For years now, the Ninjago franchise has been paying lip service to the theme that you don't need powers to be a hero, whilst never really being actually committed to it. 
Having the new main ninja of the show being powerless feels like such a strong commitment to that theme though. Aaron, you could be a better ninja than any of us. You have the potential to be the greatest ninja that's ever existed. The emphasis on Spinjitsu in Aaron's moveset is incredibly cool. It's already made for a bunch of creative fights and I'm so excited to see what they do with it next. I think Aaron's story finding found family with the ninja and trying to move past his parents being lost in the merge is really good but I think it could definitely use some more focus next season because it was a bit underemphasized here. It was still really well done and it's not like it felt poorly fleshed out or undercooked or anything like that. It just took a bit of a backseat to other character arcs this season. Overall, Aaron is not only an incredibly compelling protagonist and excellent stand-in for Legacy Ninjago fans, who perfectly slots into the found family motif that's carried the Ninjago team for so long now, but the existence of his character also serves to fix a problem that's been plaguing Ninjago's story for almost a decade now, in a way that's incredibly inspiring and uplifting from a storytelling perspective. Aaron is an excellent newcomer to the Ninjago cast, and what's wild, he's not even the best new character of the season. When it comes to the character arcs of Dragon's Rising Season 1, Sora is absolutely the standout character here. The Ninjago crew did such an incredible job of building up this character and getting us invested in her. To the point where I wanted to just straight up cheer when she unlocked her true potential. Sora had an incredibly messed up childhood, being basically abandoned by not only her parents, but her entire society. So as you can imagine, that would really do a number on someone's ability to be optimistic. My first impressions of Sora were pretty unlikable given this scene. Ninja! A ninja. But as the season went on, it did a better and better job of making me warm up to her with just that little moment being in the back of my head. And just to be clear, it's not like I outright hated Sora or anything. I thought she was a likable and entertaining character throughout the whole season. That moment more than anything just bugged me a little bit. Then we get to the episode The Last Jin, and you have this moment where it clicks and it's like, oh, that's the point. What a downer. Oh, you can never win. Why even try? Wait. I don't sound like that, do I? It's really nice having moments in Ninjago where characters act unlikable, amounts of flaws that they actually need to overcome again. Unlike one season I can't remember the name of. Sora's arc of finding her optimism and faith in humanity as she just rallies together Imperium to overthrow the Empress is really solid. And the standout moment of it for me is when Sora stands up to her parents. Ever since they reveal in episode 6 that Sora fell out with her parents, I have just been waiting for the cookie cutter generic moment where Sora reunites with her parents, they realize she was right all along, and then everything's okay. I was bracing myself for this moment. I could practically already see it. Ninjago used to be a show interesting enough to where it would sidestep something like this and give us something way more interesting instead. But I figured that time had just passed. Ninjago has dumbed itself down quite a bit since then and has become a lot more cookie cutter and generic. So I guess that's just something we're going to have to deal with from now on, which kind of sucks, but you know, whatever. What can you really- I thought I had to prove myself to you. But you should never have to prove your worth to your own parents! Guys, I am starting to think we are in fact back. Sora standing up to her parents was the best possible conclusion for this arc they could have come up with. And I am so glad they went for this as opposed to something more safe and generic like Sora proving herself and her parents instantly jumping sides. There now being a really considerable rift between Sora and her parents is way more interesting from a story perspective. It could either lead to a story about how you don't need to let everyone back into your life, or it can lead to a really fleshed out slow burn to an eventual reconciliation. Whatever they end up going with in the future, it is way more interesting than just reconciliation for the sake of reconciliation, and I'm so happy they went this route with Sora's character. I feel like Sora as a character is emblematic of Ninjago's renewed focus on great character stories, and I'm so happy to see it. Her powers are so cool, her backstory of Imperium is great, and her journey of overcoming her own pessimism and standing up to her parents is just so well written. That speech in episode 19 where Sora exposes the Empress for who she really is and turns the people of Imperium against her is such an incredible scene. Ryu is great. I don't have much to say about him because he is not nearly as fleshed out as Aaron and Sora, but I really like him. I was very much expecting the kind of merchandisable character, you know, Baby Yoda type, but no, I really enjoyed him. It's pretty interesting that one of the central protagonists just can't speak for the time being, unless he gets those telepathic dragon speak powers. But for the time being, Ninjago finds itself having to use exclusively visual storytelling to show us how Ryu's feeling, and I think it's pretty cool. He's like if one of the main ninja team members was a little puppy, and I think it's really fun. And speaking of animalistic important characters, 
Wildfire. Oh my god, where do we begin? Now, Wildfire isn't necessarily one of the new main ninja team members. That core team boils down to Lloyd, Aaron, Sora, and Ryu until further changes. But she's a really awesome new character, and I really want to talk about her. Wildfire was dumped in the desert as a little baby and raised by a wild dragon. And the best way I can describe her character is if you put a talking feral animal on the ninja team. <laughs> She poops on the floor. She has armpit parasites. This is impossible. Like trying to root out armpit parasites. Your armpits have what? She's the furthest thing in all of this show from being socially well-adjusted to other people. You know, on account of being raised by a wild animal. She has a hugely inflated ego. And there are moments where the other characters really have to try to make her care about anything. A borderline egomaniac wild animal of a person is just such a great concept for a character. Wildfire is wildly entertaining, and every second she was on screen was an absolute joy for me. Uh, if I were your enemy, why would I let you out of your cell? If you don't know, how should I? Another thing I loved about her character throughout the season is her development. As it goes on, she becomes progressively more acclimated to working as a team and generally just being a more bearable person. Getting a greater understanding of empathy, learning to regulate herself more. I thought it was a really great character arc, and it bounces wonderfully off of one of the old characters, Kai. Now, Kai had been in a pretty weird spot for a few years now, with the writers kind of not knowing what they wanted to do with him. He's had occasional good moments, like a good chunk of season 11, and like the first episode of Crystallized, but generally he's kind of just sat there with not much to do. The writers never really seemed too interesting in giving him interesting stuff or character development to go through, so he generally felt pretty useless until now where he serves as an amazing catalyst for Wildfire's character development. What I think is great about this dynamic is that Kai was the hothead of the team. He was the one who didn't work well with others, he was the one that got angry and irrational and didn't know how to regulate himself. So pairing him up with someone who basically has all of those traits that he worked through dialed up to 500, really emphasizes just how far Kai's character has come since that first pilot episode. Also, when I saw this moment for the first time, I was absolutely floored. But when I lost my sister to the sea, Master Wu had me practice my forms. Well, it worked enough to calm me down. And if it can work for me, it can work for anyone. One of my major problems of Crystallized was how it made Nia's departure in Seabound mean absolutely nothing towards the story. She just came back and that's it. The experience didn't really change any of the characters in a meaningful way, and that felt like a massive missed opportunity. But then Dragons Rising, this whole different show, came in and gave Nia's year-long departure the impact on Kai's character that I wanted to see so badly. While she was gone, Kai got really good at meditation and learned how to regulate his emotions better. A genuine progression of his character caused by the departure of Nia. For the past year now, I've been saying the absolute most definitive best way to get me back on board with the Ninjago show after Crystallized was for Crystallized's follow-up to make small targeted changes that reduce my issues with the season. I wanted Ninjago to fix where Crystallized had messed up. When I went on about that for a year, scenes like this are exactly what I was asking for. It allows the franchise's story to evolve and go in new directions with the new character Wildfire, but it also takes something that Crystallized messed up and reduces the damage it did and does it in a way that's genuinely emotionally resonant. I really felt for Wildfire being worried about her dragon parent, and I thought it was such an emotionally cathartic moment seeing Kai pull from his own life experience to help this kid. This scene between Kai and Wildfire was just such a wonderful surprise for me. Exactly what I wanted to see out of a follow-up to Ninjago Crystallized. And while we're on the topic of the original ninja team, let's talk about every single one of the other members we see in this season. Lloyd is the only member of the original ninja team to carry over into the new core ninja of this new show. Because of that, he is the one that plays the biggest role out of the original six in this new season, as you can imagine. So I think we should talk about him now. And in a stark contrast to how I felt about Lloyd and Crystallized, I really loved him in the first season of Dragons Rising. I do wish we saw a bit more of the transition from him going to being stupidly unlikable and Crystallized to Lloyd again. But I'm just happy that Lloyd is acting like how he should. But due to the long time skip between Crystallized and Dragons Rising, you can infer that he's had a bunch of personal growth in that time. And he's just so likable in this new season that I can only complain about there not being more of a transition so much. I really like Lloyd in this season. And there's a bunch of points where you can really see that this isn't the Lloyd we saw in Crystallized anyway. Don't fight how you feel. Try to use those feelings for something positive. I don't think Crystallized Lloyd would have ever said anything like this. You know, given how that season ended on Lloyd suppressing his feelings when they could have been used to save the entire world. It's just really nice to have Lloyd acting like Lloyd again. I really like this character in case that wasn't obvious, so I'm really happy that the Ninjago crew has gotten him back on track. And on top of that, this season does wonders for progressing his character. Somewhere after season 11, Lloyd kind of just ran out of stuff to do. 
He still had great moments. I thought he was really good in the island, for example. But the closest thing Lloyd got to a substantial character arc after season 11 was crystallized, which, yeah. Sometime after season 10, the idea that Lloyd was becoming a master much like Wu was dropped, which was really disappointing to me, as the idea had so much potential. However, Dragons Rising has finally picked that thread back up, and it's been really great. Lloyd's having to properly grow into the role of being a teacher now. Beyond his own responsibilities as the leader of the ninja team, Lloyd's now having to invest a bunch of energy into training up the next generation. It's just been so great seeing the original ninja enter mentorship roles. It really gives the characters a chance to highlight just how much they learned over the course of the original series. And as a longtime fan of that original series, it's really satisfying to see the characters progress like this. My favorite example of this for Lloyd comes in the episode, I Will Be The Danger. I love this moment. After years of the 11 minute seasons trying to ignore it, it's pretty cool to see Ninjago finally have moments like this. It really gives you a sense that finding out what happened to Harumi really changed how Lloyd operates as a ninja. For one, it's really great to see this character progression from season 8 finally continued, even if it took 5 years to do it. But beyond that, it's just great having moments where these old characters are informed by their past experiences and are applying that to their new roles as mentors. Lloyd in Dragon's Rising is super likable, a great return to form for the character after season 15's portrayal of him. And seeing him grow into his new role as a teacher is just really satisfying as a long-time viewer. I'm incredibly happy with how they handled Lloyd in this season. I'm also a big fan of Nia. How Nia's written in this season is a far cry from how she was written in the last one, and I really like that. In the last season, Nia was heavily victimized, and the season just basically unintentionally pushed the message that she is useless without her powers. Dragon's Rising steers far away from falling into that trap. For a few episodes of the season, Nia stays behind to do crucial research that ends up leading to the ninja stopping the merge quakes. Her unique perspective is what ultimately helps Sora find her optimism again, leading her to defeat the Empress. She's also actually able to hold her own in fights again without having to resort to her powers. It's just nice being reminded that Nia can contribute to the ninja team without shooting water out of her hands, something the last season seemed to have forgotten. It's great seeing the Ninjago series treating this character with respect again. As for Cole, there's not really much to say about him. Even in the worst Ninjago seasons, Cole is always a standout good character, and in Dragon's Rising, he's excellent as always. As for Zane, I find him to be an interesting case. The 11 minute era really heavily flanderized Zane's character to focus solely on the fact that he's a robot and nothing else. And in Dragon's Rising, there's an episode that seems to be acknowledging that writing flaw. My opinion on how Zane's handled in this new show is ultimately going to hinge on whether they actually address that flaw or not. As of right now, Zane is super likable and is good fun to watch. And it's nice that the Ninjago writers have seemingly acknowledged that there is a problem with how his character has been written in recent years. But I'm more interested in what they're going to do with him in the coming seasons than what they're doing with him right now. The last of the original ninja we have to talk about is Jay, who is barely in the season at all. I know some people were disappointed by Jay's lack of screen time, but honestly, I am overjoyed about it. Not because I hate the character of Jay or anything, even if I think he's become incredibly flanderized and annoying over the years. No, what I like about the Ninjago producers choosing to omit Jay from Ninjago for now, is that it shows that they aren't just throwing characters in for the sake of it. Jay didn't really have a role to play in this season of Dragon's Rising, so as a result, he's not really in it much. Rather than having him stand around and do nothing in the background for the whole season, if a character doesn't really have much of a place in the story for the time being, they just won't be in the story. Which I much prefer to how Ninjago used to do things. Think of it like a quality over quantity approach. You can have JB awkwardly shoved into the plot of season 1 just for the sake of him being there, which would distract from the runtime of other characters' reintroduction and development, or we can save Jay until things line up for the Ninjago producers to actually be able to tell a good story with him, which would make his actual return into the Ninjago storyline all the more exciting. So yeah, I'm a big fan of the restraint that Ninjago producers had to not just immediately reinsert all of the main ninja into the story. It bodes well for how the show is going to be written going forward. Now that we've finally talked about all of the central protagonists in this season, let's discuss the antagonists. Imperium is a really strong set of villains, I feel. Writing the villains for this first installment must have been such a hard balancing act to hit. You had to write villains that were formidable to the heroes because this was the first installment of a new story. And obviously there has to be something for the heroes to overcome. And if all of the ninja were inexperienced, like in the original Ninjago pilot, that would have been a lot easier to do. But a good chunk of these guys have 15 seasons of experience. So the Ninjago crew had to hit this incredibly fine line of making Imperium formidable and worthy antagonists to the ninja but not making them fall into the trap of being ridiculously overpowered to compensate for the ninja's experience. 
I think they did a good job hitting that balance. Imperium does a good job at being a formidable first threat for this new storyline. I'm a big fan of the character of Raptor. I appreciate how he's not really an evil villain per se, but more so just a huge adrenaline junkie. In the end, he turns on Imperium and joins the ninja just because if Imperium were to destroy the world, he wouldn't be able to do his hunting anymore. His motivations aren't outright evil, he just really enjoys hunting things for the adrenaline. And whatever faction can give him the most of that is the one he's gonna side with. Unless his own personal well-being or ability to hunt is directly threatened, in which case he will betray whoever he's working for at a moment's notice. I like to think the hard contrast between his old man looking design and young persona means he's going through a midlife crisis and is just trying to fill it with adrenaline. I'm so glad he didn't turn out to be Crux, man. You guys have no idea. I'm a big fan of this character and I really hope that Dragon's Rising Season 1 isn't the last we've seen of him because he is just a joy to watch. Drama. He's okay. I liked him in Episode 3, but I feel like he did overstay his welcome a bit by the end of the season. Still a pretty fun character though. Beatrix was super fun. Make no mistake, she's not the best Ninjago villain we've ever seen, not by any measure. But I thought she was a pretty fun character. Her backstory episode with Raz was very cool, how she just murdered her own father. She has a great voice actor and design and got some pretty good action scenes. So she's not the best villain we've ever seen, but I really enjoy how she plays the role of a fascist leader. I think she's a fun character. I love cartoonishly evil villains. Beatrix is a cartoonishly evil villain. I enjoyed her. Dr. LaRoe I don't have much to say about. Sure, they do a really good job at making you absolutely hate this character, but that's about it. Then there's... Wait, wait, who is this? I don't remember this person at all. Was your hair a different color, maybe? No, it was always this color! <laughs> One of the most notable villains in this season, I feel, is Imperium itself. Beyond the soldiers, Rapton, the Empress herself, the way the society is set up and hurts living creatures en masse, I think is the big antagonizing force of the season. I think it's cool just how much time this season puts into fleshing out the society of Imperium, how it operates, how its people feel about it, what they get up to in their free time, Previous locations in Wild Brains and Jago installments have very much just been jumping off points for the villain of the season and not much else. Whereas Dragon's Rising has really went out of its way to make Imperium feel like a living, breathing, fleshed out place. I think the true antagonist of this season is the place itself and how it operates. One of my favourite moments in the entire season is when Laro refuses to go through of draining the Source Dragon, due to the harm it could do to the world as a whole, and literally instantly Imperium finds someone to replace her and do the job for her. It's genuinely a pretty scary moment as far as Ninjago stuff goes, in my opinion. And I thought it was really cool. But the standout in terms of villainous characters, without a doubt, is Lord Raz. I absolutely love this character. Where do I even begin? His design and voice acting and general presentation is just impeccable. He's got a super intimidating design and his voice acting really backs that up. But what I think is cool is when you first see him, you figure, okay, this is the evil brute character, sure. But as the season goes on, you realize he is the true manipulator behind everything. Lord Raz is like a parasite. He just leeches onto people and milks them for everything they're worth in order to fulfill his own ends. And as soon as it becomes unviable, he uses what he milked as a jumping off point to find someone else to manipulate. Lord Raz is like if you took the most intimidating parts of Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine and smashed them into one character. He's an absolute menace and I am over the moon excited to see more of him in season two. And what's even more exciting to me is that Lord Raz isn't even the worst villain we're going to be facing. At the end of the second half of this season, it's revealed that Lord Raz is working for someone even more scary. We don't know who this person is, but we know they're out there somewhere. And I am so excited to find out more about Raz's master. I'm just really happy that we have this long-running mystery now. Ninjago is at its absolute best when it is telling full-on serialized, interconnected stories. Only trilogy, first two seasons as an example. Sure, the outcome of the long-running Vengestone by a plot fell short, but I'm glad that didn't deter Ninjago to try doing stuff like that again because there is so much potential of that format of storytelling so I'm just so excited that Ninjago is sticking with it and that's generally how I feel about Dragons Rising season one it has made me so excited for the future of this show and sticking to that theme I want to talk about one final thing before we wrap up this review the Oni Trilogy was the peak of my enjoyment of Ninjago. Never had I felt so passionate and excited about this theme before, and never have I since. As the original Ninjago show continued on, I found myself more and more disappointed that they never managed to top the Oni Trilogy. They certainly tried chasing those highs again by bringing back elements from it and trying to ape off it, but it never quite worked. For a while I figured that was it. I was never going to get the level of enjoyment I got from the Oni Trilogy from a new piece of Ninjago again. Even ignoring the objective quality of the show, I was 13 when the only trilogy came out. Things are just different when you're that young. You enjoy things more, you have a more optimistic look of the world. Not bogged down by responsibility or emotional problems or yada 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 yada. So I figured I'm just older now. 
I can still enjoy the show, sure, but I figured that level of excitement and a new piece of Ninjago content was just something I'd never feel again. Then I watched this scene for the first time. Elemental powers come from you? Of course. I am one of the seven Source Dragons. Where did you think elemental powers came from? And then it clicked. A whole number of things about this scene is what did it, from the wonderful reimagining of the season 9 dragon theme getting me really emotional, to the gigantic scale and amount of mysticism seen in the source dragon scenes, to the huge mind-boggling reveal that this guy is the one who made elemental powers. This scene just made me feel passionate about this IP in a way that I haven't in almost half a decade now. It made me feel a way that I figured I just can't feel about this show anymore on the basis that I'm older now. This is how you go about topping the Oni trilogy. It was never about bringing X or Y character in, or focusing on the Oni, or whatever. The reason the Oni trilogy worked was because it was a bold evolution of what we loved about the Ninjago IP. The Oni trilogy worked so well because it was new and inventive. It took the franchise and characters to places we've never seen before, and leaned way into the serialization that Ninjago excels at. And for the first time, after a few false starts, I can confidently say, I finally feel like we have the natural evolution of the Oni Trilogy. Dragons Rising Season 1 is an absolute triumph, and one of the best Ninjago seasons we've had in almost half a decade. The fact that they managed to snatch up such a massive victory straight after one of Ninjago's worst installments ever is unbelievably impressive to me. I never thought it possible, but here we are. Dragons Rising has not only fixed Crystallized, you know, for the most part, other than Harumi, Dragons Rising has set Ninjago up to hit its new peak, and that excites me so much. So here's what the Ninjago crew needs to do going forward. Don't get complacent. Keep pushing forward like Dragons Rising Season 1 did. What you're doing now, keep doing that. Lean to all of the strengths. Continue bringing new things into the show. Continue progressing the characters in meaningful ways. Continue the big new emphasis on great character work. Continue expanding the lore in the way you have this season. And keep leaning into the serialized elements between installments. If the Ninjago crew can maintain the quality of Dragons Rising Season 1 going forward and even expand on it, then Ninjago will have its new peak. Ninjago Dragons Rising Season 1 was an excellent start to this new era for the franchise. And I am over the moon excited to see what ground it covers next. 2024 can't come soon enough, man.